Chapter 11 Charles and Anne Love at First Sight December 1927 Anne Morrow felt annoyed. She'd been counting the days until, dis until Christmas break, eager to be alone with her family. But a stranger was but now a stranger was horning in on the family's holiday. Charles Lindbergh, no less. She supposed it was the polite thing to invite him. The only reason the aviator was even in Mexico was because her father, Ambassador Dwight Morrow had asked him to make a goodwill flight to that country. After landing in Mexico City just 10 days before Christmas, Charles had been asked to stay on at the American embassy and spend the holidays with Morrow and his wife Betty it would Betty assured him be a wonderful get family get together all the Morrows would be there 23 year old Elizabeth 14-year-old Constance and 19-year-old Dwight Jr. Even the their middle daughter 21-year-old Anne was traveling all the way from Smith College in Massachusetts. Charles had hesitated. The thought of an old-fashioned Christmas sounded by a large, loving fa family made him very uncomfortable. But the alternative, reporters trying to fear it, Out his holiday traditions, of which he had none, was far worse. Morrow's home, with gate with its gates and guards, was a haven of privacy. For a few days, at least, he'd be free from prying eyes. He'd accepted the Morrows' invitation. Now, on the ride from Mexico City from Mexico City's train station to the American Embassy, and guessed what he'd like be like a regular newspaper hero, the baseball player type. Of course, that sort of man didn't interest her. She wanted someone with whom she could share her memories, her stories, share her stories and poems. A man as passionate about words as she. From the newspaper photographs, she knew Lindbergh was a good was good looking, but who wanted a lady killer? She certainly had no intention of worshiping Lindy like everyone else the car came to a stop in front of the embassy and 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 Anne climbed out of the back seat she hurried up the wide m marble stairs and found charles leaning against a stone pillar a tall slim boy so much slimmer so much taller so much more poised and I expected a very refined face, not at all like the grinning Lindy pictures, a firm mouth, clear straight blue eyes, fair hair, and nice.
nice color. It's feeling suddenly very confused and overwhelmed, and Anne held out her hand, and an expressionless Charles shook it. Anne spent the rest of her visit in a state of distraction and bewilderment. She stammered and could not meet their guest's eyes. Why is that attractive men? Why is it that attractive men always terrify me and put me at my worst? She felt like a lump, the dark haired middle daughter who wasn't nearly as pretty as her sparkling older sister. Meanwhile, she was experiencing an utterly surprising emotion. The flyer had swept out of sight all the other men I have ever known. All the pseudo-intellectuals. The sophisticates. The posers, the arty people. All my life, in fact, my world, my little embroidery, bare boned world is smashed. Although she kept her feelings secret, Anne had already fallen in love with Charles Lindbergh. On the last day of his visit, Charles borrowed a five-passenger silver trimotor plane and took Anne, along with her sisters, Elizabeth and Constance and her mother, Betty, for a ride. As she climbed into the seat directly behind him, Anne said to herself over and over, God, let me be conscious of it while it's happening. Let me realize it and feel it vividly. Let me be conscious of it. The propeller world the engine sputtered. The plane rumbled across the field, picking up speed. Anne could feel every bump and rut. The ground came toward her faster and faster. The ride became bumpier and bumpier. until suddenly it was smooth. She felt suspended in time, suspended in air, her heart rising in her throat as they went up, 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 a real and intense co consciousness of flying flooded over her. On the sword above fields where cows and sheep were mere specks and the embassy looked like a dollhouse. Oh, to go on and on, I could understand why people never can give flying up, she later wrote in her diary. Soon, though, she found herself more mesmerized with the pilot than the flight. He was so perfectly at home. Every movement quiet, ordered, easy, and completely harmonious. I don't know how I can say that, really, for he moved so very little, and yet you felt the harmony of it, she noted, and his hands. One hand on the stick one hand he was he has the most 
tremendous hands. The grasp. The strong wrist. The grip of the thumb. When the flight ended, she stumbled from the plane, dazed. I will not be happy till th it happens again. She confessed in her diary. A week later, Anne returned to Smith College to finish her senior year. Even with the frenzy of that last semester, classes, papers, final projects, she couldn't get Charles Lindbergh out of her mind or heart. And, and Charles, he got back to the business of flying. It would be months before he gave Anne another thought. The Importance of Good Genes In the spring of 1928, not long after his twenty sixth his twenty sixth birthday, Charles sat in an Indiana hotel room with pen and paper. He'd made a decision. It was time to meet girls. And so, in the same way he outlined specifications for a plane, he listed the best qualifications for a wife. Good health, good form, good sight and hearing, he wrote. More importantly, a girl who likes flying, because he would take her with me on the expeditions I expect to make in my plane. That ought to be great fun. Intelligence? Absolutely, but he didn't care about formal education. It was an attitude of mind he wanted, not a mass of knowledge. He also thought a mental attractiveness, although he didn't exactly define that. Above all, she had to come from superior stock, genetically. My experience my experience in breeding animals on the farm had taught me the importance of good heredity, he said. Environment, Charles believed, had little to do with physical and mental superiority. When you saw the mothers and fathers, you could tell, tell a lot about their offspring. Charles believed mating was the most important choice of life. One mates not only with an individual, but with all, but also with that individual's ancestry. And he had no intention of diluting his extraordinary Lindbergh land genes by marrying a woman whose own were not conducive to evolutionary progress. He was hardly alone in his thinking. After World War I, groups with, with names like the Race Betterment F Foundation and the American Breeders Associ Association had sprung up around the country. Their goal was to spread the, wor the word about eugenics a pseudoscience that advocated improvement of the human race through controlled breeding. Eugenicists believed heredity determined not only by a person's physical features but also their mental and moral character. Desirable traits like honesty, intelligence, and industriousness were passed on from generation to generation. So, too, were undesirable traits such as shiftlessness, criminality, drunkenness, and feeble-mindedness. A catch-ball term that included everything 
from severe mental illness to learning disabilities even poverty they claimed could be blamed on inferior genes during the 1920s it was common for eugenicists to host better baby and fittest family competitions at state fairs and local exhibitions exhibitions contestants completed a questionnaire about their physical and mental health their church going their hobbies their interests and other matters their answers were then scored on a scale created by the the American Eugenics Society, a national organization de dedicated to promoting eugenics education to the public. Family families earning a B plus or higher received a medal engraved with the words, "Yeah, I have a goodly heritage." It was an award for best human stock not unlike the blue ribbons given for the prize hog or biggest pumpkin certainly charles had encountered these genetic competitions during his barnstorming days when he dropped in on local events to sell airplane rides he may also have come across the theory while at the university of wisconsin by 1921, the eugenics movement had become so mainstream that most college-level biology textbooks devoted a chapter to it. And doctors, politicians, philanthropists, and the general public readily adopted it. Most eugenicists were middle to upper class middle to upper middle class white pro protestant and educated they celebrated the qualities of the nordic and anglo-saxon races and disparaged others who threatened the nation's racial strength this was largely due to world war one which had given many Americans a greater fear of foreigners at a time when immigration to the United States was increasing since the turn of the 20th century the country had experienced a surge of immigrants mostly from Russia and south southern Europe close to half a million people a year to many white Americans it seemed as if the nation was being invaded by the poor and uneducated people who didn't speak by English and did not look American afraid of being overrun these white Americans embraced eugenics they believed the genetically fit themselves should be encouraged to have large families. But how to keep the unfit from reproducing? In 1924, Harry Laughlin, the pres president of the American Eugenics Society and a man who believed that the central miss mission of all politics is race hygiene lobbied Congress urging its members to change the nation's immigration policy speaking before the House of Representatives immigration committee Laughlin told members what they already wanted to hear immigrants were polluting America's 
bloodline with feeble-mindedness, insanity, criminality, and dependency. The resulting legislation, the Immigration Act of 1924, did everything Laughlin had hoped for. It set strict quotas on various undesirable races, Jews, Asians, and people from Southern and Eastern Europe, while still welcoming large numbers from Britain, Ireland, and Nor Northern Europe, said President Calvin Coolidge as he signed the act, America must remain American. Just three years later, in 1927, the same year Charles flew across the Atlantic, the federal government real legalized sterilization for the socially unfit. In an 8 to 1 ruling by the Supreme Court, the state of Virginia won the right to forcibly tie the fallopian tubes of 17-year-old Carrie Buck, whom the state had declared feeble-minded. In his majority opinion, opinion Justin, Justice all, Oliver Wendell Holmes wrote, It is better for the world if instead of waiting to execute degenerate offspring for crime or let them starve for imbecility, society can prevent those manifestly unfit. Three generations of imbeciles are enough. By 1931, 32 states had passed eugenic sterilization laws, and over the next 40 years, between 60 and 70,000 Americans of both sexes were sterilized. Most of these laws would not be replaced until the 1960s and 1970s. So it wasn't surprising that Charles insisted on a wife from genetically good stock, since he considered himself a superior specimen. He felt duty bound to choose carefully. Having completed his checklist, he began his search. Girls were everywhere, Charles said, but it was hard to get to know them. Because of his fame, they didn't act natural. Instead, they treated him with awe or curiosity. They were too shy, or worse, too forward. If he actually talked to a woman for more than five minutes, the newspaper had, in had him instantly engaged. And if he ever did manage to ask one out, he couldn't take her to dinner or a movie without its becoming front page news. By September 1928, he changed his strategy. He would, he decided, confine his search to the families of the political and business leaders he'd gone to gotten to know in the past year. Not only did some of them have daughters his age, but their large, well-protected -protect home, homes provided him pr privacy from the press. It was this pragmatic thinking that led him back to the Morrow daughters. Not the sparkling, vivacious Elizabeth, but the one resting in her shadow, Anne. Charles admitted surprised that she'd resurfaced in his memory. 
in Mexico he had noticed her only casually. Could it have been that Anne came to mind after he became aware of Elizabeth's heart condition? Having contracted rheumatic fever as a child, the Marles' oldest daughter, daughter suffered from a damaged heart valve, hardly the superior and spec superior physical specimen he was seeking. Whatever the reason, Charles began making more plans, this time for achieving my objective with the girl. Not only had he never been on a date with Anne, or any female for that matter, he hadn't even been in contact with her since Mexico. Still, he was already determined to marry her. A date in the air and one on the ground. After some thought, Charles decided to approach Anne with an invitation to fly and then extend it into a date on the ground but not until he had a detailed practi practicable and solid plan in place did he telephone the Marles' home in Englewood, New Jersey it was Chris it was a crisp clear afternoon in October and Anne, who had graduated from Smith the previous spring, was home for the month with just servants for company. She'd been writing poetry, filling her diary with rich words, when her mother's social security interrupted. Charles Lindbergh, she told Anne, was on the telephone. Still infatuated, feeling faint and frantic, Anne picked up the phone and whispered weakly, Hello, hello? Hello, this is Lindbergh speaking, came the response. He got right to the point. Would Air can to go would Anne care to go flying? Surely he didn't want to go with her, she thought. He must have called for Elizabeth and learning she wasn't there had asked Anne out of politeness. She tried to put him off, but Charles refused to be diverted. About what time could, could I come, he asked. To tomorrow? She stammered. Tomorrow what time? Tomorrow afternoon? Well, what time tomorrow afternoon? Any time you say. Any time after three? Well, tomorrow at four, we shall we say. I'll see you tomorrow then. Anne later admitted to feeling somewhat concerned. He was like a small bo boy, she wrote in a letter to her sister Constance. Action decided action. Follows thought at an amazing speed. There are no complications. Good day for fishing. Off. Presto. Like that. She had forgotten how handsome he was, so tall and thin, his face sunburned, and his hair so fair. Anne, on the other hand, looked a mess. She'd thrown together an outfit she hoped would be appropriate for flying, Constance's riding pants, a woolen shirt of Betty's, and their father's, and her father's thick gray golf stockings which she'd stuffed into a pair of high-heeled shoes over it all she wore a red le leather coat charles roared with laughter when he saw the high heels as he led her to the, his car he told her about the day he'd planned first they'd have lunch at a friend's house, and afterward he'd take her flying in a biplane he'd borrowed for the afternoon. Now really, please don't let me be any more bother than is necessary, fussed Anne. 
She still did not grasp that this was a date, replied Charles, blue eyes twinkling. It's no bother at all. They drove to Fallais, the Long Island mansion of Harry Guggenheim. Months earlier, the millionaire had invited Charles to make the 350-acre estate his home and had given him a bedroom suite overlooking Long Island Sound. When he wasn't flying, this was where the aviator could usually be found swimming, fishing, or taking off from Guggenheim's private airstrip. Charles seemed entirely at home in the palatial surroundings. Pushing open the great carved door without knocking, picking up his mail casually, noted Anne. Her here was a completely different side of him. Gone was the cold and reserved hero, just terribly kind and absolutely natural and rather a dear, Anne later wrote. It was all part of his plan. He knew the wealthy, educated Maros considered him a bit unpolished. By bringing Anne here, he allowed her to see how easily he fit in with with society's first families and how at home how at home he felt living among gatehouses and towers and lawns and peacocks. After lunch, he took Anne out to the air strip. He strapped her into her parachute, he helped her into the plane, and gave her a few simple flying instructions. Then they climbed into the air. She, the wind whistled past Anne's face. The groan of the plane's engine filled her ears soon they were f so far up they could see both shorelines of Long Island I can't describe the f flying Anne recalled it was too glorious three days later Charles took Anne for an evening ride in his car. The two drove for hours along back roads and through dense fog, talking honestly about what mattered most to them. Charles explained his passion for flight in a way that made Anne see that it was a means to greater ends. Successful flights across the ocean, he believed, would bring nations closer together. They would be linked up through aviation in both distance and understanding. Airplanes would become instruments of peace instead of war. In the nest-like warmth of his car, with the engine, the engine purring, Anne felt contented and comfortable. E even the silences in their conversation felt natural. Lower lowering her guard, she shared her dream of becoming a p published writer. You like to write books? He s said in astonishment, obviously recalling his miserable experience producing We. He added, I like to live them. On the ride home, he asked her to marry him. You must be kidding, she exclaimed. You don't know me. Oh, I do now. Oh, I do know, he answered. He knew that, like him, she was basically shy. She was also healthy, intelligent, and attractive. And she obviously didn't delighted in fly day, flying. She could easily be shaped into a dutiful life. Beautiful wife. 
wife and crewmate. If love entered into Charles's decision, he never mentioned it, and seemed to in instinctively understand her expected role. He, he was, she wrote, a knight in shining armor with myself as his devoted page an apprentice to someone more experienced in a world of which I knew little but w which I was eager, eager to explore what was said after the proposal neither Anne nor Charles recorded but Anne's answer was definitely yes